Hi folks, I'm Father Joe Grimaldi. You can call me Joe, and I'd like to welcome you to my podcast. But now, here's our host and friend, Ken Calvert. Hi again, everybody. It's Ken Calvert along with Father Joe Grimaldi, and welcome to the Father Joe Podcast. In advance, I would like to thank you all for your emails, getting some great emails with some questions for you, some simple, basic questions. So I'm going to pepper you with just a few. Do you mind? No, not at all. Okay, it's an open forum here. Whatever happened to pagan babies? When I was a kid, you had that jar in your bedroom or somewhere, and you would put your loose change in there, and that was for the pagan babies. We did the same thing, and I go back a lot longer than you. Mm -hmm. In any case, what happened, I think, uh, it's my own opinion, that in the beginning, the pagan babies was a way of getting people interested in supporting those who are helpless, those who need help in every way, whether it be health-wise, education-wise, and so on. Well, as time went on, and I always think uh, that we've progressed exponentially, if you want, uh, with uh, different organizations that help the poor, local as well as foreign and i think we have so many different groups that are helping the those who are deprived that uh, there was no more need to have that little jar getting pennies from the students to support michael Uh that nobody knew right we well i remember you got to name your pagan baby when you reached your goal yeah and so that uh, the church in the Middle East, the church in Africa, the church, and so on, uh, progressed with those few pennies that were brought in from the different schools, Catholic schools in the United States. Well, now there's so many other organizations that I don't think there's a need to do that kind of thing. But it really heightened interest as well as the need for some help for these people that are absolutely helpless and Mm -hmm. homeless and they need help in every way well and and pagan suggests as well i believe and i think you're going to correct me because you normally do but they haven't really been educated yet as to the word of god jesus christ it's not a politically correct word to use what pagan (laughs) yes okay Uh, but I think I know what you're getting at, and I agree with you. They're well, not... Oh, uh, I didn't say pay. I said pagan back in the day, though. In the day. In Polit- the day. It's no longer politically correct to say pagan, is that right? It's uh, iffy. Let me put it this okay, way. Okay, you sort of recoiled. You can't see it, folks, but he sort of... <laughs> eh. Yeah, it's not a nice word to use. Okay. But those who are uncatechized, if you want, those who we want to have join the church with the missionary efforts of the many missionary orders throughout the world, I guess we call them uncatechized now. Uncatechized. Yeah. Uh They have not received the catechism of the Catholic Church. Catholic Church has a lot of words. They do. They really. (laughs) no, No wonder... You fellas are in school for so darn long. You have to learn all those hard-to-say words. But we sometimes never learn them, so it's okay. (laughs) I think we hear that message all the time, especially now from Francis. Such an important part of what we do as Christians, as Catholics, to make sure that we take care of and look out for the poor. Exactly, because he speaks highly of the dignity of the human person. He constantly speaks about that. And because if we find people, they're human beings, that's what we have in common. You want to share what you have with those people that need it. Another email that I got, and I think I know the answer to this. Are men or women more religious from your point of view as a parish priest? I'm not trying to play games, but we have to define religious. Men are much more private about their religious practices. Uh Women are much more emotional, I think, Um, much more, uh, how shall I put it, openly acting out their religion, Uh, and so they become more obvious. One of the things that I find interesting in Scripture, if you look at Paul, for Paul to do the work that he had to do um, as far as preaching the Word throughout Greece and and Northern Africa, and so on and so forth. He couldn't do it alone. And guess who helped him? Always, always, always. And some are named. Like Lydia is a very important person in the life of Paul. 
she was a wealthy uh, merchant of clothing, a cloth material, I should say. She was the one that helped him financially. She also made sure that he had a place to stay. Uh, she made sure that there was always a respite for him when he was tired in all of his missionary activities. It's interesting that women have always played a very important part in the activities of the church. Um, today, it's no secret. Without women, I don't think our churches would be able to function as well. If you look at any given church, you'll see the women doing the linens, you see the women cleaning the pews, you see the women preparing for the different activities, mm -hmm. you see the women leading the prayer groups and all of this other stuff. It doesn't mean, in my mind, that men are less religious. It means that they have a different way of expressing their religion. Uh, women are much more open about it. Men keep it within their hearts, usually. But you'll find, if you question each individually, I think there isn't that big a difference as far as their reverence for religion but there is a big difference in the way it, it's expressed. Just recently, we had a beautiful, beautiful Mass uh, over at St. Hugo's, which is a parish not far from here in Bloomfield. And uh, it was interesting, it was a healing Mass. Now, the orchestration of that event was truly complicated. For example, there were many, many of the, uh, the uh, nursing homes brought their people in by bus. They were met by young students, the people that came, and then they were escorted to their seats. I'm speaking about four or five hundred people. That's okay. a big number. A big number of the invalids, if you want, but not just the invalids, some who felt that they were sick and didn't have obvious show of what they had, mm -hmm. but they were able to manage themselves. But who did all of that? I look at uh, the people who organized it from the beginning, all women. The people that organized the Mass, all women. The people that organized the lavish and beautiful luncheon because you know that they did a beautiful job decorating the dining room. Mm -hmm. For all of these people, I'm speaking about big numbers, and so that uh, it was the women again. So without the women, I don't think the healing mass would have been as impressive. I forgot, and that's my bad, as the kids like to say. I forgot about the healing mass. If you can, take me through that. Well, the healing mass is basically a special event that we hold annually, uh, and every parish does it in a slightly different way. But we use the sacrament of anointing during the mass, and so that... Uh, we have several priests that help celebrate that Mass so that we could expedite the anointing part because the priest has to do the anointing. And therefore, at a special time, the leader of the group, who was the pastor on that day, um, will instruct the other priest to take this section to the left, this section to the right, and so on. We had about 11 priests wow. that were able to to uh, do the anointing uh -huh. among the people. Nice. And we break it up so that it's not just, um, you know, there's different sections like a prayer over the oils. Uh -huh. And then the Mass would continue with readings and so on. Then you have the laying on of hands that you, that's part of the sacrament. Huh? You lay hands on the individual. And then the actual anointing that takes place. So, it was very beautifully orchestrated by these women. And as I say, I don't know if it could have uh, come off any better uh, if they weren't there. That's nice. And so it's not that the men are not active in the church. They certainly are. For example, of course. in the business uh, section of the church, um, you know that they're the ones who are uh, making sure that the collection is done and, and the ushers are done and all this yeah. other stuff. Oh, yeah. So. But it's just that the women, you see a lot more of what the women do than yeah. what the men do. Well, I, I think that's uh, 
A great answer, by the way, and a very, very important part of the church, which leads me to this once again. Another reason why I think women should be able to be ordained priests. You can take baby steps. I know that being a deacon is not all that easy. That's quite a process. Is that a starting point? You hit the nail. On that proverbial head? Beautifully, sharply. Uh I think what's going to happen, and again, it's an opinion. It's an educated opinion, but it's an opinion. I'll say it is. (laughs) (laughs) You have deacons around the world. The need of a deacon is so great in those rural South American countries and also parts of countries that there is a real lack of priests. You know, we always speak about a lack of priests everywhere, but for the most part, so far, it's been a demographic problem rather than a lack of priests. Years ago, they built churches here, there, and everywhere. Well, now the here, there, and everywhere are not the center of the cities anymore. They've moved to other places. So all of a sudden, you have all these extra churches that you don't need, and so people very often get very upset when a bishop is forced to close a parish. But it's because of demographics. Now, when you speak about South America, and when you speak about Africa, there's a real dire need because the population is such that it's a real challenge for priests to go, you know, just by themselves. They, they need a lot more people to sure. go down and do that. So since you already have deacons who have gone through a lot of serious study, most dioceses today require at least four years of study, and then they're ordained deacons. Well, why not ordain the deacons to become priests starting in, let's say, South America? Correct. Or starting in Africa and so on and so forth. And then maybe it'll catch on elsewhere. There's another thing, too, that I think might be considered is the idea of married priest. What I mean by that, there are a large number of priests, once a priest, always a priest, Mm -hmm. who are no longer practicing because they chose to be married. And so it might not be a bad idea to consider those people who have married They were priests, but left to marry, Mm -hmm. and now they can be officially a part of parishes and so on and so forth. So, as you said, there's baby steps, and I think eventually, since a number, well, a lot of the mainstream churches have women priests, and a number of them have women priests. Bishops. We see it all the time. All the time. Outside of the Catholic ropes, if you will, yeah. for the uh, lack of a better metaphor. But sure. uh, I think the time to really start considering it, though, is now, and I hope it is. Well, I'm sure behind the scenes it's being discussed. Mm-hmm. That's what I mean. We don't always hear right. what's being discussed in the Vatican. So I have another email here. Somebody was asking about that stage in your, your kids, your children... I guess you don't call them children, young adults. At what age do you notice that they tend to start drifting away from or straying from the church? I'm going to answer that with a different answer first and then answer you directly. All right. Uh, In the United States, there's a movement uh, among many of the dioceses. I'm guessing as of today there are about 50 or 60 dioceses in the United States that have confirmation almost the same weekend that they have First Communion. Because as I mentioned once before, ordinarily communion is given to somebody who's in full communion with the church. That means they've been baptized, they've been confirmed, Mm -hmm. and now they receive communion. So now, what I'm saying is many of the churches, many of the dioceses, are asking the pastors to train little ones, when I say little ones, age of reason, uh, around seven. Uh, So before they receive communion, let's say on a Saturday, they might do confirmation, 
and on Sunday they will be uh, receiving First Communion. There's a lot of arguments pro and against that method. And the reason I say that is because so many of the people say, well, forget confirmation then. Nobody's going... Well, if confirmation does what it's supposed to do, they need to be strengthened at that time. That would be an answer that would be for that way of doing it. And also, it would take away the stigma of confirmation being a carrot that you hold up in front of the kid Mm -hmm. and you have to go to religious ed every week. And then when you're a sophomore in high school, you'll get confirmation. Well, that gives the kid the impression, well, now I'm graduated and I don't have to do religion anymore. Uh, I think it's been proven that statistically almost most Catholics stop learning about religion when they're in the eighth grade, if at all. I think you're right. And so they don't know much after Yeah, you that. know, I, I, pardon me for sort of no, la- sure. laughing out loud, but I was thinking it's basically a basic training. Yeah. <laughs> Once you get out of basic training, the hardest part yeah. is behind you. <laughs> but you want to get rid of the idea of the carrot, of the confirmation being a completion. So I had my confirmation when I was in about fourth grade, I believe. It varies. Okay. Usually it's eighth. Maybe it was the eighth grade. Yeah, and then later on... It's By the golly, I think you're right. Sorry about that. I, no. You know, I'll take that back. Okay. Yeah. And then sophomore year in high school. But the problem there is, as they say, it, um, it makes confirmation the end of your studies. Now, what's supposed to happen then? Well, more effort should be put into making the religious ed classes more interesting so that the people would keep on coming rather than saying, well, okay, they've received confirmation in the first or second grade, whatever it is, and now no more religious ed. That would be a tremendous mistake. But if we continue putting effort in making religious ed classes more and more interesting, it might foster the people to really voluntarily go to all of these classes to learn more about their religion. If I remember correctly, at Brother Rice, I didn't have to take anything religious after my sophomore year. I don't think. I See, think we had it every year. Did we? Yeah. Okay, well, that tells you how. <laughs> Again, We don't remember, but that's okay. That's why I'm the co-host, ladies and gentlemen. You <laughs> see, I play the part of the guy who, who is basically learning the process uh, from the beginning and paying much better attention the second time around. Don't let him fool you. He knows, <laughs> he knows a lot more than he says. <laughs> I go to St. Google every, every single day. No, you're tremendous. But, uh, no, but I do find that I think it just also comes with maturity and, you know, that, that liberated feeling that you get. You know, a driver's license. You know what I mean? And the chance of being able to stay out until midnight once you're 18. A lot of kids, I think, kind of put religion on the back burner for a yeah. while. They do, and you know, if they follow the usual pattern, yeah. there's an old saying in the Catholic Church that very often people are hatched, matched, and dispatched. <laughs> okay, so, well, they, they certainly want their baptism. Surely. And then they come back for... Uh, marriage. Marriage. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, when I, they're in the box. I guess when I go to the other side. Huh? So it's interesting how... The mentality is those are must. Those three, those three things are very, very important. In between, hatched, they matched, struggle. and dispatched. <laughs> right. I like that. Hatched, matched, and dispatched. Is that on anybody's tombstone? Because if not, I'm taking it. <laughs> <laughs> but to get back to what I was trying to say before, I think once they become young adults in their 20s, they many of them just lose interest. And it's not until they meet a significant other and they start talking about the future and start talking about marriage Mm -hmm. that they start to get interested again and maybe want to be married in the church, maybe not. But maybe, let's put it this way, but for argument purposes right now, let's say they do. But then again, there's another lull. People will stop, and then the important thing, the first child. Then they get serious about religion. Uh And all of a sudden, you see them coming to church 
And it's beautiful to see them come as a family, huh? holding the infant, sure. holding the child, you bet. Yeah. and so on. So I, I think, thank God, the Lord loves us and waits for us always to come back to him when we're ready because he loves us unconditionally. And so he embraces all of these good people and hoping that they will return and most do eventually and I, i'm that's my own opinion you sort of created a norman rockwell picture for me if you will when the young couple with their first child comes in and you're you're at the pulpit and you look out and you see that it has to be a beautiful thing to see and a great feeling inside exactly and of course catholic education when they have to make that decision see I think that makes a big difference, by the way. Yeah, good and bad. Mm-hmm. Good and bad. People sent well, listen their to kids, you. sent their kids to Catholic schools for different reasons. Okay? Yeah. Do we send them to Catholic school because of discipline? Uh huh. Yes. <laughs> or <laughs> or is it for religion, which is the purpose of it? Okay. Yeah. And I have a feeling, particularly having worked for many years in Hawaii, and many of in a Catholic school, a Catholic high school. And I would say about 40% would be Catholic students. All the rest were non-Christian or non-Catholic. And so the reason why they came to the Catholic school was discipline. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. well, that's a good point. Listen, um, we've barely scratched the surface, so what we're going to do is continue with this theme on the next Father Joe podcast. I'm Ken Calvert along with Father Joe and we look forward to you joining us. So we will continue with podcast part two with more of your emails but in the meantime thank you so much for joining us. We remind you as always please tell a friend share the good word. And keep on listening. <laughs> yes, you know, you're learning this radio thing very very well. Happy day. <laughs> Happy day indeed. It's the Father Joe podcast. We'll see you soon. This is Father Joe Grimaldi, and I look forward to seeing you next time on the Father Joe Podcast. If you have a question or a comment for the Father Joe Podcast, send it to fatherjoepodcast at gmail.com. That's fatherjoepodcast at gmail.com. Follow Father Joe on Twitter at Father Joe Podcast. The Twitter address again is at Father Joe Podcast. Please subscribe to the Father Joe Podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, tune in, and soon on iHeartRadio. We also ask that you rate the podcast and feel free to leave a comment. And finally, if you have a friend that you think might enjoy the podcast, please pass it along. Thanks again for listening, everybody, and see you next time.